I'm Pete Leiden. I'm the founder of the media company reInvent. I'm here on the beautiful campus of the University of California, Berkeley, for a two-day conference in which uh, many of the professors, technologists, social scientists of the UC Berkeley system are meeting with leading folks from the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, rooted in Paris. They've come together here for two days to think about the impact of the next wave of technologies, AI, robotics, on work, on jobs, and how fundamentally the economy has to transition quite quickly. We talked to them about their thoughts about what is the kind of moment we're in right now, what are the biggest challenges that concern them most, what are the most promising solutions, and ultimately how they feel, how confident they feel whether we'll get through this okay. So we're trying to get tap into people's sense of um, how unusual this moment is or where we are in the kind of historical moment at some level, like to what extent with the evolution of the global economy and where our technologies are going and for that matter the politics overlay of that, how do you think about the time we're in right now? So I think we are in a transition both economically and politically that is of the magnitude and scale of what happened um, a couple times in history, but the one that I'm closest to was the, uh, in historic terms, was the Industrial Revolution and what coincided with it of the progressive movement and at the turn of the 20th century. It was those two corresponding times were extremely important, not just for economy and corporations, but for the entire political system, our governance, the disruption that's happening in how people feel about how the country's working. So I think we're in that kind of moment again. Um, so that's, that's the closest I can think of. The 50-year situation is the um, collapse of a great many tasks that people used to do or are still doing to provide value in the economy. That an awful lot of paper shuffling tasks in the next 50 years are going to be taken over by software bots. And an awful lot of generally blue-collar, traditionally male tasks are going to be taken over by robots, one way or another. And a few, some occupations will disappear, many occupations will be transformed, um, the income and wealth distribution will be upset, either in a positive or a negative direction, from this 50-year frame. And this 50-year process is what we're, those of us upstairs at this conference are mostly worrying about. And then there's a 10 to 15-year um, frame which is how much of this is going to happen in the next 15 years as opposed to the next 50? How fast is the 50-year process going to come upon us? And where exactly will be the first sectors and first places in which the coming of, call it the rise of the robots, um, both the replacement not just of blue-collar manufacturing workers, but also blue-collar construction and blue-collar transportation and distribution warehouse workers um, are going to be hit by the coming of technology. And also where a good deal of the, of what used to be white collar work is going to start disappearing as expert systems and software bots take it over. We see the rise of what people might call freelancers or self-employed people, independent contractors. So a survey we did a year ago in Western Europe, in the EU15, and in the United States measured how many people are earning income in this new way. Uh, and what we found is the numbers are quite large. I mean, close to 30% of working age people said in the last 12 months they had earned money somehow outside of a traditional employer-employee relationship. And about half of those were doing this as a supplemental basis. So this might be a teacher who's a tutor in the evening, could be somebody driving for Uber on the weekend. Uh, it might be um, a professor who also sells books or gets paid for giving speeches. Uh, and then about 15% you know, working age people were doing this as their primary source of income. And they report incredible levels of satisfaction. Uh, there was a perception going into this research that maybe these are people who can't find a permanent job. But what we found is 70% of them said, no, this is how I choose to be working. Um, now, 30%, to be fair, said, yeah, I'd really like to find a, you know, permanent, a more permanent type job with benefits. Uh, so it's a mixed picture. But the vast majority of people said this is how they wanted to work. And in the future, this may grow because the flexibility that it enables 
is very well suited for people nearing retirement. It's well suited for people taking care of small children or perhaps their elderly parents. It works for students. And so I think that as we think about work in the future, it will be much more of a blend of working for yourself as a freelancer or working for an employer or a mix of both or maybe periods of one and then the other. So I think the whole nature of how people approach their careers is going to be more fluid and changing. I think there's a terrific irony about the fact that we have had this meeting today when the U.S. has just, the Senate has just passed a tax bill, which in every feature, every feature, is actually going in the wrong direction relative to this. I, you know, I happen to be a supporter, and I'm one of the, it was odd for me, given my party affiliations, of reducing the corporate tax rate in the United States. I think it's important. I think those firms are going to invest more. But I'm not at all sure they're going to invest more in ways that generate a lot of jobs, because you're going to invest in this technology. And the technology per unit of output is not employing that many people. So basically, we may get investment. We may get growth. What is the distribution of the productivity benefits? What's the distribution of the income benefits? What's the distribution of the jobs? I don't think, and by, by passing a, a, a major tax bill which denudes the government of money, uh, all the stuff we're talking about throughout this meeting, the need for more training, the, <laughs> the need for more early childhood education, we just heard about the importance of that, which I know, I've seen, I've seen the neuroscience literature, you've got to do something on early childhood education. We don't have a public policy in the United States for that. And we've just taken away a bunch of money from the federal government, and we're going to take it away from the progressive states like California who want to do it, or New York want to do it, and say, sorry, can't do it, no money. So I have to say there's a kind of depressing irony of, or something about being here to discuss these issues uh, and realizing that at least one of the major players here is moving a step away from what needs to be done. So the biggest thing I'm worried about is not are we going to go through an era where robots are going to eat all our jobs and there's not going to be work in the future? I, I, I'm not worried about that in a longer term sense. I'm worried about the transition. And I'm most importantly worried about will our political institutions and our institutions more broadly, including education institutions, be up to the scale and pace of the challenge? I mean, we can see a, a transition that's occurring. It's a little bit like climate change was 15 years ago. And so I think what's got to happen is we need that same scale of thinking about all those kinds of institutions that really reinvented themselves, not from the inside, but from the outside during the progressive movement. We need to do that today to all kinds of institutions, from the way we elect people to our higher education and public in, uh, higher education institutions, to how we think about our responsibility of the social safety net, those types of things need the same kind of fundamental rethinking that we had in that era. The problem is that the qualifications required for the jobs that are created to replace those jobs that are eliminated um, are different. And we do not teach children, we do not educate children and young people to adjust and relearn and reinvent themselves again and again and again. Hmm. And therefore, there might be mass unemployment at the same time as there's plenty of work to be done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that can only be addressed by the right kind of education, which in K through 12 will need to be preparing them to change, transform themselves again and again, reinvent themselves again and again. And then at the other end of the spectrum, um, creating uh, continuing education opportunities uh, that will keep them updated and, and uh, with, with the right uh, competencies uh, throughout their lives. Well, if people are displaced from technology, I mean, there's going to be a big challenge from automation. And how do you take people mid-career and retrain them? And this is something that no country has really done at scale. Because you're talking about people who have done one thing in their life. They may have children. They may have a mortgage. They have financial obligations. 
they aren't going to be able to go back to school for two years or four years and earn a new degree the way we think about education. So there's going to need to be a big rethink in training and how do you give people credentials or nano degrees in a wee matter of weeks rather than months. Now that could well mean that some of those people then choose to in fact uh, you know, become freelancers, particularly when you think about the geography of where jobs are going to be lost, where they're going to be gained. The difficulty is change is hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's an old rule that all change is bad even when it's good. And we're, in the mid we're going to be continuing in the middle of this. We've, it's not that automation is new. Or, you know, read the automation is going to kill us all uh, uh, articles from the 1950s about uh, you know, automation is going to close all the auto factories. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go back to the 1800s on similar. So the storyline is constant, but here, here we're at the next big shift. This shift has the opportunity of affecting a broader swath of what we do as people in the workers, people in the economy. And it affects people with a higher cognitive uh, role in society rather than mechanical. Mm -hmm. But the mechanical parts are going to get affected also. So the good news is we'll get better products, we'll get better services as I suggested, but well, there will be a very different way that people help provide any part of them. Some parts, people will have no, no good role in it because the machine is simply able to do certain things that are reasonably well-defined better than you can. And the hard part, from my point of view, is how do we smooth this transition? How do we speed the good parts? How do we mitigate the rougher parts? Some of the people who are really good at what they're doing today may not be especially good yeah. or not especially eager to do the other things. Yeah. You know, we've, you know, in, the, in the newspapers and in, you know, interviews, we all know these examples. You know, what does a coal miner want to do as a second uh, uh, job? And you know, the problem is, after you've been doing coal mining for 30 years, you haven't had a chance to think about what else you might yeah. do. You know, this is not suggesting you're incapable. But you've just been tunneled in down a particular path. How do we find something that is even more valuable both to you and society? And this is an unpro unsolved problem at this point. Governor Granholm of Michigan yesterday told a heartbreaking story about a town in central Michigan. Um, 8,000 people of whom 3,000 work in the refrigerator plant. Um, those 3,000 workers make a very good living for Michigan at the start of the 2000s, some 35 bucks an hour, I think, in wages and benefits. But the refrigerator plant goes to Ciudad Juarez, and they're left being lucky to make 12 or $15 an hour um, because their skills, their machines, um, their lifetime of experience bashing metal and forming refrigerator, operating things that form refrigerator coils, there's really not much demand for that, and they truly can't transfer their skills to anything else of great value because the principal source of their income was sharing in the rents created by the refrigeration companies' dominant market positions and embedded technology. And that's a danger that's going to happen to a lot of people who become independent workers. I don't believe these solutions are going to come in from Washington, D.C. anytime soon. I don't think the political process is lending itself to forward thinking, and I also think the the t kinds of solutions we're going to need are not, don't lend themselves to someone sitting in a room coming up with a solution, writing a law that never changes. So I think what we're going to need is much more room for policy flexibility and be able to experiment more about what might be working around the country. And then when we understand what's working, have that scale and perhaps be law nationally. Things that I think are promising are mostly things in that mindset that aren't happening in Washington but are happening in smaller scale around the country. So on that one, there's some interesting things that's happening with um, the, the, uh, in New York City in terms of black car fund being expanded to other benefit opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think there are some interesting things that are being talked about and, and in process in both Seattle and in parts of um, California that create mechanisms to do something similar. 
I think there are um, a lot more opportunity to do those kinds of experimentation if people thought it was possible and could try it. Um, I'm also excited about things that are um, uh, opportunities to help workers uh, transition and improve their uh, skills and uh, job prospects that are allowing them to still work at the same time, whether that's apprentice programs or whether that is um, uh, disaggregated certificates and things, or something more substantial like the uh, competency-based online university that's Western Governors University. So mm -hmm. there are pockets of things that are pretty interesting. Western Governors, which no one has ever heard of, I'm sure will have is going to have 100,000 students this year. Mm -hmm. um, and it is competency-based online. People still work at the time they're taking, getting their degree mm -hmm. in in-demand fields. It takes on average three years for the, them to get a degree. It costs $6,000 a year, including free textbooks and a mentor. And on average, people make back the cost of their education within 18 months. Mm. We need a lot more of that kind of activity, and we need it at scale. To what extent do you think California, um, not just the urban center, but just as a state, uh, mm. supermajorities, progressive supermajorities, right. to what extent do you think California could crack a different model around these economic, future work, mm -hmm. labor, kind well, of automation think... issues? Look, it's a very big, it's a very big, very diverse economy, and as a very big, very diverse economy, I think California does have the opportunity to do that. We actually do have a very powerful, uh, with a long history of success, community college system. We actually do have a very powerful and long history of success uh, state college system, and we have the university system. Though, those systems, we we all recognize at each level of that, ed that powerful educational set of institutions, we all recognize that we need to rethink what we're teaching, how we're teaching, um, what should be our links, how can we strengthen the links with the ultimate employers for whom for, for, we're providing education to the individual. The individual is looking for pathways and networks and, and jobs. Uh, understandably, and so uh, strengthening those links between the the employers, the the private sector, and the university are very important. So I I think we have a really good organizational structure in place, and I think we have a really firm commitment to maintain these things. So we have to deal with the flex the future of education as the future of work evolves. I am fairly convinced that. What is needed for people to be able to cope in the new economy in terms of competences, uh, to a very high degree, is a a number of people skills. Um, the more we the more we automate, the no, the more we need a people dimension on top of the automation for us to be willing to buy. I mean, people don't buy. A machine or a machine's product. People buy a human being delivering the value of what can be done by a machine. So we can actually build some of those competences into the very educational process. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we we will build education so that people become and all people become competent in. Um, interacting with the machines, mastering them, so that I, th I think we'll find that we'll less and less talk about artificial intelligence and more and more talk about augmented intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the intelligence that's being augmented is the human intelligence, uh, the ability for humans to use machines with embedded knowledge and deliver value on top of that. And all of that is being built into the way the educational system functions, almost the same way as our classical school was built as a testing ground to be disciplined and, and structured along the lines of a, of a factory job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's, it's really reinventing the educational processes so they are similar 
to the business processes and the value creation processes of society? The first is really to create the kind of infrastructure, institutions and incentives to make lifelong and lifelike learning a reality for all, to give people the opportunities to decide you know, where to learn, what to learn, how to learn, when to learn. I think this is absolutely crucial so that people you know, keep moving when technology adapts. Because in the Industrial Revolution, we had a once for all chalk, and then people had to upgrade to this. Today, it's a continuous evolution. That's the first thing, sort of, to build this culture of lifelong, lifelike learning. The second is to shift from, you know, the reproduction of subject matter content, learning something towards the developing the kind of social emotional qualities and character qualities that really give people the drive and the motivation and the capacities to, you know, work in a diverse, complex world, in a world that is ambiguous, volatile, complex. Mm. Sort of what you need today is to have that kind of compass. Mm -hmm. and the navigation skills to find your way through this world. And uh, if you don't, people get, very, get lost. And that's where people then get upset with the kind of world that we have. Now. The whole idea of information technology and as a way of augmenting human intelligence and, and productivity rather than information technology as a way that we can substitute capital for labor and get these, wor these annoying workers out of the factory and still produce as much. Um, that that was a key and a revolutionary um, social goal of Silicon Valley as it existed in the 1980s and 1990s from the coming of the personal computer to the flourishing of the internet. And in some sense, Silicon Valley has to figure out how to do this again. And organizations like, you know, say, Berkeley's engineering school kind of have to help them because large companies certainly... Um, they tend to be much more interested in figuring out how to use information technology to shed annoying and expensive workers, rather than how to give those annoying and expensive workers more control over their lives. Hmm. Well, I think all companies are going to have to think about investing more in training. Uh, when you look at the aggregate national data, what you see is that corporate spending on training their workforce has been declining for several decades. And that trend is going to need to be reversed. And the training that does occur often ha uh, is targeted on the highest skilled workers anyway. So I think there will need to be a shift in all companies thinking about building the talent they need and developing their own talent in-house as opposed to just trying to hire from the outside, particularly for occupations where there are a lot of shortages of skills. And we're starting to see that shift. But I think all companies are going to have to, going forward, think much harder about building and creating the talent pools they need as opposed to expecting uh, to be able to hire people with exactly the set of skills and experiences they need. And as a final question, how confident are you that we'll make it through that transition? Are you optimistic about it or, or, or concerned? If we look at what, what's structurally happening in our economy and with our technologies, um, I think we are closer to creating moments where we get new types of choices and where we can make um, uh, balanced and well-reflected choices that will become the beginning of a new grand period of human civilization. Mm -hmm. I, I actually do believe that most of the UN Sustainable Development Goals are achievable if we do things right. There are reasons for pessimism because in a number of areas, we do not make good choices right now. And we do not move towards better distribution of the created wealth. We do not move towards higher choice and higher inclusion. Uh, but that's because we make wrong choices. And since the sort of the technology opportunities and the globally structural conditions are such that we could make the right choices. We, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of 
um, pushing for those. The willingness of societies to put, you know, to invest in the future, to put people first, is really, I think, where we can learn a lot from, from East Asia. Northern Europe, Finland also, a country where life for long, life wide learning is quite well established. Denmark, Sweden as well. But then you go sort of Southern Europe or you go to the United States where you can't see very much of that. The United States lives on talent that it attracts from the outside. It's not actually really good in developing talent at scale. No? You take some elite universities, that's great. You know, that puts the kind of tip of the iceberg. But when you look at the bulk of the of the talent, I think these countries are severely challenged in the future. So in a nutshell, some countries are really on that path. Uh, but uh, I had a very interesting conversation with the <coughs> governor of Chongqing in mm. China, a province which is in western China, sort of a relatively poorly developed province. And this, this governor was talking uh, with me about you know, 21st century skills. And I asked him, you know, why do you focus that much on those kinds of skills in this province that really is so, sort of, it's still so basic in its economic structure? And he said, well, you know, we produce 45% of the, of, the, of the laptops for Hewlett Packard here. No? But you know, in a decade from now, each and every of those jobs is gone. So we got to think about you know, the generation after. You don't hear much of that thinking in the Western world. No? I would say I'm not confident at all. You know, um, that I would I'd say that our income distribution now, wealth distribution, appears to have managed to tilt itself in a bad way. And certainly in an economy, um, if you want the economy to pay attention to you, you'd better have money. And the money is too concentrated now. And if you want the polity to pay attention to you, you better have a movement. And yet somehow it seems that the age of the internet and of the decline of manufacturing is one in which it is much harder rather than easier to create durable social movements. Right now, I saw a recent statistic that something like 87% of Americans surveyed in the, by Pew said they expected that continued technological change would lead to continued income inequality. That is my, I think they're right. I think unless we do anything in a whole set of policies to address that. We, we already know, in a sense, what's going to happen, because the last 30 years have already told us what's going to happen. Okay, we, we hollow out the middle. We, for those people who have the right skills, usually higher education, sometimes a tertiary education, not just secondary, tertiary, and you know, master's and doctor's degrees, they're complemented by the technology, meaning the, comp the technology augments their skills, or the technology can't be done without them. I mean, it can't be done without them, OK? So you get job growth and income growth there. You get all of those professional software engineers. They're constantly moving from firm to firm. Their prices bid up all the time because uh, those skills are complemented by the technology. So the middle erodes. People who, who might have been in the middle slide down to lower income jobs uh, towards the bottom. And that's what we've seen that over the past 30 years. And I don't see without serious changes in policy why that would not continue to be the case. I would say I'm a worried optimist. I'm an optimist by heart. And I think that. Um, the U.S. in particular, but all countries are remarkably adaptable, right? We've the when, if you look at U.S. history, we've been here before. In the shift from an agricultural society to a manufacturing society a hundred years ago, came the rise of the U.S. high school movement, where only 10% of people completed high school in 1910, and 40 years later that was 80%. Mm -hmm. So was a massive shift towards sending everyone through secondary education. And then after World War II with the GI Bill, well, lots of people started finishing college. So we've done it before. So as an optimist, I'd like to think that we're going to rise to the challenge again today. But I am concerned. If you take the most optimistic view about what leadership was like post-World War II, it wasn't every CEO. It was a, a group of them who, in both in local communities and nationally, took it upon themselves to lead and to be role models. 
And so I think that's what we need here. And I'm not pessimistic about that. There are people who are doing that. Um, they, they need to be um, celebrated for it. They need to recognize, we need to recognize that everything they do isn't going to be right, and they're going to make mistakes and learn along the way. But we need them to be uh, talked about as public leaders and assume that role not just because they're creating great technology or creating shareholder value. Um, I think there, are, um, the, the, there was a rich history in this part of the country through um, Hewlett and Packard individually their companies and many of the companies and individuals that spun out of that, that were part of that history in this in this part of um, of uh, the Bay Area, and I, I think much of that still lives. I also think there are, are other newer leaders, Mark Benioff of Salesforce as one example, who totally understand their role and are engaged in an aggressive way. I think we need more of them. They don't all you don't all need to wait until you're a billionaire to be able to do that. Um, I think there are. It, it, there are enormous number of people who join companies and stay with them because they feel the mission and accomplishment. It's actually a good idea from a business standpoint as well. So I'm, I'm not Pollyannish about it, but I do think there will be people who step up.